What is the job of an economic hitman? You just asked the key question, Patrick. And in this hand, I'm offering you a lot of money for you and your friends. And if you choose not to take it, in this hand, I got a gun. What would you do? I'm an entrepreneur. What do I know? I'm just a regular guy. Private plane crashes are the best way to assassinate someone if you ever decide you want to do that. <laughs> the corporation business model is we're going to put you out of business. Your business model is more the mafia business model because it could cost your life. A few suitcases filled with dollars is nothing compared to sending in troops. These are bribes, sex, power, and money. Do you think China's using any of that economic hitman business model? You don't want to negotiate with us? You're strong arming me? Watch what I'm going to do to you. Wait a minute, wait a minute. We, we never created a virus I never said like that. I never said biowarfare. Does that mean we should retaliate with our own biological weapons? No, not at all. What does it mean? I'm learning how you sat down with these prime ministers and presidents. The glaciers are melting. The polar bears are out there standing on single icebergs. The oceans are rising. Species are going extinct. I hope all the audience is taking notes. We we wake up and we look around and we say, oh my God, what's happened? So my guest today may be one of the most interesting guests I've ever had. And I've had a lot of interesting guests. And let me explain to why that is. Imagine if you are thinking about writing a book based on experiences you had that influence a lot of economies around the world. Then you go to 29 publishers and 29 publishers say, we do not want to touch your book. Then eventually somebody picks it up. And the book comes out. The title of the book is called Confessions of an Economic Hitman. It stays on, on a, a New York Times best list for 70 straight weeks, translated in 37 different languages, and sells over a few million copies. And you come out with part two called The New Confessions of a Hitman. You write that book, and you end up sharing the stories of people you were participating with and negotiating with. Imagine writing a book like that. And more importantly, imagine living a life of somebody who has the ability to write that book. That's my guest today, John Perkins. John, thank you so much for being a guest on Valuetainment. Patrick, it's my pleasure to be here with you. Thanks for having me on your show. It's great to have you. So, so do I go on Craigslist? Do I go to Monster? Do I go to Courier Builder if I'm trying to apply for a job of wanting to be an economic hitman? Where do I go apply to want to be an economic hitman? How does that happen? Well, first of all, I would suggest that you don't do it. It's, it's, it's <laughs> you know, I thought it was my dream job until I realized it was my nightmare job. Uh, yeah, and you know, the, the, what happened to me was uh, when I graduated from business school, uh, I, uh, I was trying to avoid the draft. The Vietnam draft was, was strong then. I was married to a woman whose father was very high up in the U.S. Department of the Navy, and his best friend was very high up in the National Security Agency, the NSA. Um, and that a job with the NSA was draft deferrable. So, you know, he arranged for me to have an interview. Uh, and I spent a couple of days on a, most of it on a lie detector uh, going through this very, very intensive interview with the National Security Agency. And uh, I think, you know, they, they, they found that I had three weaknesses. I can go into those if you want. But sure. <laughs> OK, so, yeah, I, I grew up in a boys prep school, uh, boarding school where my dad taught. And we never had much money. And I was surrounded with kids with a tremendous amount of money. You know, I lived on a house on campus. I had I ate with these boys from the age of four. So I, ne I never wanted for food or shelter, but we never had much money. And I'm surrounded by these kids who come from the area where you come from. They came, some of them came from Tehran. I, and some of them came from Buenos Aires and Paris and Park Avenue, New York, very, very wealthy. I was always very jealous of their wealth. I, I, I wanted to do things they had done. I also grew up in a place pretty devoid of women. So I was very shy around women. And I, you know, I wanted, so what the NSA discovered during these lie detector tests was that I really craved sex, power, and money. And that was, that gave them the hook to get in, to get into me. Then they actually encouraged me to join the Peace Corps for a couple of years, go to the Amazon rainforest. And you know, the, the guy who was high up, very high up in the NSA, when I heard, I heard about the Peace Corps, I went to this talk that a Peace Corps recruiter gave at, at the business school where I was just about to graduate. And I was very taken by the idea of going and living with indigenous people who had always had a fascination about 
he encouraged me. He said, we can help you get in and we can make sure you go to the Amazon where you live with real authentic indigenous people. You'll learn another language, you'll learn survival techniques. When you come out, uh, you'll be all that much more ready to work for us. But he added one more thing. He said, you know, you may not actually end up working for us. You may end up working for a private corporation. A lot of our people do that. We get a lot of our information that way. And that's exactly what happened. When I got out of the Peace Corps, I was recruited by this private consulting firm, Charles T. Maine. And uh, as an economist, uh, I became chief economist fairly quickly, and that led to <laughs> becoming an economic hitman. That's it in a nutshell. Now, when you went to the Peace Corps, did you did your problem of sex, power, and money get solved, or no? Not a, no, <laughs> not at all. And, and I write about that, you know, in my most recent book, Touching the Jaguar. I go into some detail uh, about that. I did learn another language. I learned about other cultures. I learned some incredible survival techniques. I at one point became very, very ill. I, I couldn't keep any food down. I was dying. And I'm a three day terrible uh, adventure to the, get to the nearest medical doctor, including a, a full day hike through very dense jungle. And then a two days of riding in a rickety old bus of winding curvy roads up to about 10,000 feet altitude. No way I could do it. A shaman cured me that night. I can go into that more detail if you want to, but to make a long story short, he, he cured me and then required that I become his apprentice as, as payment for what he'd done for me. Um, but you know, Patrick, this is 1969. I'd never even heard of a shaman. There was no future in shamanism in those days. I, sure, I surely did not want to be a shaman. But the, guy, <laughs> but the guy saved my life, you know? So... As it turned out, that was a very, very fascinating experience because one of the things that taught, it taught me that our reality is totally molded by our perceptions. It's perceptions change everything. And that became very, very handy knowledge for me when I became an economic hitman because basically economic hitmen use perception to mold reality. Very, very, very interesting transition from there. By the way, before we go into the economic hitman, what were some of the interesting questions, if you remember, that the NSA asked you in the interview? Well, here's, here's, here's an example. They asked me, you know, how I felt about the Vietnam War. And I, I was, I'm, a, I'm on a lie detector. I was truthful. I said, I, I have no desire to go off and kill people who've never done any harm to me or be killed by them. And I don't think they're a threat to our country. Well, I thought that was totally screw me. You know, they wouldn't be interested in me after I said that. Another one was when I was in, in, in college, when I was in, earlier before I went to business school, I was at Middlebury College. I had a good friend there who was Iranian. And uh, um, he, he, his father was actually a, a general in the Shah's army. Uh, and uh, one night, uh, 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 we were at this bar, we were at this kind of discotheque. Again, the details are in the in touching the Jaguar. We were at this bar and, and I ended up getting sucker punched by a big farmer from the hills of Vermont. And, and uh, my friend Fahard, this, that wasn't his real name. I don't, don't use his real name, but I can give it to you. But he, he, he pulls out and he had this technique he'd shown me before. He'd been a professional soccer player for the Club of Rome. He was older than anybody else in his class at Middlebury. He'd taken time off, played soccer. And he had this, he carried this small jackknife and he'd put his thumb up along the blade, so just a little tip of the blade show. And he'd show me how he'd done this. And that this night he did it. He swept it across the guy's cheek. And of course the guy thinks he's been stabbed by a knife, but it's, just a, it's really just a little pinprick, but it draws blood. It scares this farmer, it's terrified him. He screams out and, and Fahard grabs me, pushes me into the men's room. We jump out the window into the Otter Creek, the river down below. We go, we get back to the dorm. And um, the next morning, I'm picked up by the campus police. They take me to the police station. I'm sitting there waiting in the waiting room of the police station. And out comes Fahad from another room with a closed door. He's not allowed to talk to me. They usher him out. They usher me in. And they, they grilled me on this. And I, I totally lied. I said, oh, I didn't see anything happen. No, as far as I know, nothing happened. We, we, we left. I don't know anything happened. I totally lied. And now I'm under a lie detector test with the NSA and they say, have you ever had any run in with the police? And I have to tell them. 
And so now I've got these two counts against me. There were some other things that went on, you know, that we went into the thing about obsession with women, with sex, but totally shy. And, and also I've, I've said I'd post the Vietnam War. I've lied to the police. Well, I later discovered they loved that. The fact that I had the guts to lie to the police was the kind of person the NSA wanted. <laughs> and, and the fact, you know, that, that they didn't care about the Vietnam War. This was, they, they already knew at this point, this was 1968. They, they basically knew we'd lost Vietnam. And the NSA didn't, they, they, they didn't care. That wasn't a problem for them. So these things that I thought were against me, one that they didn't care about, the other one really served to my advantage. And the fact that, and of course, I didn't know uh, the connection at that point that, that Fahad and his father, who was a general in the, in, the, in the Shah's military, had a very, very strong connection with the NSA. So you know, these things at the time that I thought were just going to screw me, actually worked to my advantage worked in your favor wow that's interesting so so you know for for those who haven't read your story who haven't read the book what is the job of an economic hitman well and again you know my official title was chief economist economic hitman was it was kind of like calling a, a cia operative a, 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 a spy you know you don't you don't, you don't call them that <laughs> um, but um my job really, and, I, and I, had a, I had several dozen people, very highly qualified young people working for me, but my job was to identify countries with resources our corporations wanted, like oil in Iran, for example. And then in, in most of these countries, arrange huge loans to that country. Now, Iran was an exception there. They didn't need loans. We just wanted their oil. That's another story. But in general, it was to arrange a huge loan to that country from the World Bank or one of its sister organizations. But the money never actually went to the country. Instead, it went to our own corporations in the United States to build big infrastructure projects in the country. Things like power systems, electric power systems, industrial parks, highways, ports. Uh, so the country was put into debt, took on these huge loans, and the collateral was the resource that was usually still in the ground, like oil. And then our companies were, made these huge profits by building these big projects, these infrastructure projects. And, you know, I went in with the belief that this would help the people of the country become more prosperous. And these were poor countries for the most part. And that this would help them become more prosperous. Because in business school, I was taught that. And the economic models show it, that if you invest a large amount of money in infrastructure, the GDP, the gross domestic product, grows. It does. And so all the models tell you this is the way to help a country. But over time, as I was in this job for 10 years, and perhaps because I'd been in the Peace Corps, I began to understand that actually it wasn't, that the poor people weren't getting any better off and the middle classes were getting poorer actually. It was just a few rich families that were making a lot of money. And what we know now is that these statistics are very skewed. So GDP is a reflection of how well the wealthy are doing. It's not a reflection of how well everybody's doing. For example, if you take the United States today, there's three individuals that have as much wealth as half the US population. If those three individuals made a return on their investments last year of 10% and half the US population lost, lost 3%, we should still show a gain in GDP of something close to 5%. So we see that, that you know, this whole idea that the shaman had taught me that perception molds reality, that creating a perception that GDP is benefited by infrastructure, that's true, but the perception is that GDP reflects how well the country's doing for everybody, and it doesn't. That's a false perception in almost all cases. It took me a long time to, 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 to understand that. Once I understood it, I really didn't want to believe it, Patrick, because I was making a lot of money. I was now getting all the things <laughs> And I had told the NSA I wanted, I was getting lots of sex, uh, lots of money, and lots of power. And I was whining and dining with presidents, you know, uh, uh, one of them sitting behind you there in, in, in the picture behind you, the Shah of Iran. 
Uh, and, uh, you know, so, <laughs> so it, once I knew what I was doing was not what I pretended to be doing, what I portrayed myself to be doing, helping poor people, I didn't want to admit it. I didn't want to believe it. I wanted to keep buying into the procession because I thought I was living the American dream and I didn't want to let go of it. John, so if we can go back to the system. So if, if you if you were to tell me a step process, would you say step number one, identify a nation that has a lot of resources that we need, that we can uh, monetize, that they're not doing well financially? Would you say that's step number one? Yes. Okay, what's step number two? Step number two is to send uh, somebody like me and an economic hitman in to convince the president or the minister of finance or whoever is in control that they need to accept a huge loan from the World Bank or the Asian Development Bank or the Inter-American Development Bank or one of these organizations and use that money to hire U.S. corporations to build big infrastructure. So, in there. Oh, got it. So, so you so actually so you do a study to to show that if they invest let's say a few billion dollars in today's terms into building an electric system, you show that for the next 20 years, the economy is gonna grow at a pretty pretty high rate. Got it. So, so number one, identify a nation. Number two, go send somebody like yourself, a chief economist, uh, AKA economic hitman to meet with the Ministry of Finance or the PM or the president, whoever it is, the main leader, and tell them, we can go to World Bank and get a loan for this much money and have American business create infrastructure in your country. And that's going to create a lot of jobs and it's going to benefit you. And in that conversation that you're having with them, is that a forced conversation or is that a butter, smooth, yeah, amicable, everyone's going to win? What kind of a conversation is that? You just asked the key question, Patrick. It's a, so you go in and you're armed with a very sophisticated report that your financial experts, the guys who work for me, they, you know, we produced econometric models, fancy you know, the mathematical models to show how everything would benefit, how much industry would grow and how much, so on and so forth. You go in and you hand this to the president and you basically say, hey, Mr. President, if you take this loan on and it's gonna really benefit you and your family and all your friends because your family and your friends own the industries. They own the banks, they own the commercial establishments and all of those are gonna benefit from infrastructure. Oh, and by the way, uh, our, our construction companies are gonna hire your brother-in-law's firm that happens to lay pipe. <laughs> and, and your sister owns the John Deere franchise. We'll, we'll, we'll run a lot of John Deere equipment and we'll pay top dollar for it. We're not gonna try to negotiate her down. We're gonna negotiate her up. Mm. In fact, you, you actually, you end up often, let's say paying $2 million to rent equipment that should only cost you a million dollars. It's a bribe, but it's a legal bribe. You, nobody can find you fault if you made a lousy decision and paid too much. In fact, nobody's even going to look. But if they did, it would. They, you know, you'd get out. So you, you, all these ideas. Oh, and incidentally, Mr. President, you and your all your ministers and your cabinet, all of their children are going to get scholar. We're going to help them get into colleges. My my company was in Boston. A lot of good colleges. We had a lot of contacts. We're going to get them into the best colleges in in Boston area, and we're going to give them full scholarships. And we're going to give them jobs during Christmas vacation and summer. And when they get out of college, they have guaranteed jobs with us. These are bribes. But actually, we went out and we talked to the press, the Boston Globe, the Boston media. And we said, hey, you know, we gave a million dollars last year in scholarships to kids from poor countries. We don't mention <laughs> that those were the kids who didn't need the scholarships. But so there were all the, you know, there were very strict anti-corruption laws in the United States in those days. And I guess there still are. But there's so many ways to get around them. And we, we knew all those ways to get around them. So you go in and you tell the president this. You say, so buy, buy into this loan. And he says, but we're going to take on this huge debt. And it means we're going to have to take money away from education and social services and, and health care to, to pay the interest on the debt. And we say, yes, but you're going to make a lot of money, you and your family. So he knows that he's doing something that's probably not going to help his people, but it's going to help him. And then you also say, but if you don't choose to take the road, the, the, this, uh, if you don't choose to take this deal, remember what happened to Mohammed Mossadegh in Iran. Remember what happened to Salvador Allende in Chile. Remember what happened to Arbenz in Guatemala and Ziem in Vietnam and Lumumba in the Congo. These are all presidents or prime ministers who refused 
to play the game and were taken out in coups or assassinations. And so basically we're saying, remember there's people we call jackals behind the scenes. So basically I'm saying, hey, Mr. President, in this hand, I'm offering you a lot of money for you and your friends. But in the, and if you choose not to take it in this hand, I got a gun. No, I didn't actually carry a gun, but I knew those guys were basically CIA assets behind me that had guns. And you know, the classic case of the original case was, was Kermit Roosevelt who, who overthrew Prime Minister Mossadegh in Iran and replaced him with the Shah. And that, was, that set a precedent. And wow. these presidents all know this. They right. know they know the history. They know they will be taken out. If they, so, so what's the choice? You know, Patrick, what would you do? <laughs> well, let me ask you, when you are saying it, how are you saying it to me? Like, I know the way you just said it right now. How would you say it to me if I'm the Shah of Iran and you're sitting with me and you're telling me here's the options? Let me if you if you could role play with me, what would it be like? How would you well, say it? Course, yeah, first of all, with the Shah, we didn't we didn't play quite that game because he had plenty of money. He didn't have to take a loan. We were just trying to convince him that he, he ought to work with us rather than the Soviet Union, that he ought to, you know, we, we wanted his oil. And we were willing to help him westernize his country, and we didn't want he didn't want to go the Soviet route. So that was a little bit different. We'll, we'll get but to that say, in a minute. Give me an example of somebody who you did. What? Yes. Yeah, so let's, let's say I'm talking. Let's say I'm talking to you. You're you're you're, you're the president of Colombia. Okay. Uh, and and we, we want to get at your resources there. And and, I, and I'm saying to you, I'm showing you all these fancy reports that show how well your country's going to do. And you can show these reports to your press and to your people. You can convince your people that by taking on these loans, you're helping the country. You're going to build these big dams. You're going to build these big electrical systems, whatever. So you get in, you get all the material you need here. And and it, it's usually a series of meetings, maybe some of them over lunch with a few cocktails, et cetera. And the president's maybe like a little, and then you, you just sort of subtly start talking about, you, somehow you bring up the topic of what happened recently to Salvador Allende in Chile, or what happened to Arbenz in Guatemala, depending on what part of the world you're in, you, you talk about these people and you say, you know, isn't that a shame? And you, you talk a little bit about this. And, you know, depending on the president, different presidents, you, you approach differently. And, but they get it. I mean, they know the history. It doesn't, you know, these guys know, what, know what's going on and their advisors know what's going on. And they're usually sitting there at the meetings too, some pretty smart advisors who probably, you know, been to business school, the same business schools that I went to and so forth. And they're everybody's, you know, I, I speak Spanish, but half, most of the people in the room can speak English too. And they, they fit, you know, they get the same background. But I will say, Patrick, and I mentioned, I talk in the book about two presidents who did not play the game. Uh, democratically elected president of Ecuador, Jaime Roldos, and the head of state of Panama, Omar Torrijos. They had tremendous integrity. They saw what I was trying to do, and they didn't do it. And they, they, they understood the dangers they were taking, and they talked about these things. And both of them were, were, I believe, assassinated. They were, they were both taken out in two, almost a little over two months apart from each other in 1981. They were taken out in, in their private planes in Ecuador first with Jaime Roldos, his, his private plane crashed, very suspicious circumstances. And less than three months later, same thing happened to Omar Torrijos in Panama. These were the only two guys that stood up to this, that said, we're not buying these deals. And in fact, made a big point, uh, public relations. They, they went out there and made very strong statements and they set examples for the world. And they were taken out in these plane crashes. And although there was never a smoking gun found because in a plane crash, the smoking gun goes up in smoke. Um, plane crashes, private plane crashes are the best way to assassinate someone if you ever decide you want to do that. <laughs> and uh, because of the evidence is gone, but in the case of, of uh, 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 at least in one of those cases, Jaime Roldos, the, the, the plane's engines were sent to a laboratory in, 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 in Switzerland or Sweden, Switzerland. Um, and they concluded that the plane had not crashed. It had blown up in the air. And so, um, and, th and there was tremendous other evidence. There's tremendous evidence that, 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 that points to these having been assassinations. How much longer were those assassinations <laughs> after you sat down with them? Uh, well, with Omar Torrijos, I'd been sitting down with him since the mid-70s. 
And this happened in 81. So this had gone on. He'd meanwhile negotiated the Panama Canal Treaty with Jimmy Carter, which turned the canal over to the Panamanians at the end of the, at the, end of the millennium. And <clears throat> Roldos had only been president for a couple of years. So it had been a fairly short period with Roldos. Roldos died first. He was a lawyer. He was a college professor. He'd run on a, on a campaign platform of forcing the oil companies, and that was Texaco from the United States primarily, to pay a fair share of its profits that it made from Ecuadorian oil to the Ecuadorian people. It was a pretty reasonable thing. And he said, if they don't do it, I'm going to nationalize them. And of course, the oil companies didn't like that. And, he, and I couldn't talk him out of it. I couldn't talk him to take these deals. And he goes down in this plane crash. Right after that plane crash happened, Roldos, uh, excuse me, Torrijos got his family together. And, and I, I know some of the members that were there personally and said, my brother, Jaime Roldos of Ecuador was just assassinated by the CIA. And I'll be next probably. But he said, you know, don't worry about it because I've accomplished, a, I've accomplished the biggest thing that I wanted to accomplish. And that is I got the canal back in the hands and the canal zone back in the hands of Panamanians. I successfully negotiated that contract. So I'm ready to go. And he stuck to his guns. Well, that's a, that's, that was a poor, poor turn of phrase there. <laughs> he got taken out. But very few presidents had that kind of you could, that's amazing. Exactly. Guts are insanity, you know, I mean, they, you know, and, and it still goes on. I mean, presidents of these countries are, are in very, very, very difficult positions. So, so, so let me ask you this. So, so if we go back to the system, number one, identify the nation that qualifies for what you're looking for. Number two, go in and get a loan from a World Bank and create businesses there and jobs. And in return, we're going to take care of your kids. We're going to put them at Harvard. We're going to put them at Brown. We're going to put them at Columbia. We're going to put them at Yale full right scholarship, all this other stuff, you're going to be fine and we're going to pay you some kind of an income. Number three, if you don't, here's what could happen to you that happened to the following six, seven, eight people. That's the business model. Is that pretty accurate what the business model is? Yes, up until that point, yes. Okay, so who came up with this business model? Is there somebody that you guys say, well, the founder of this business model was John Doe who used to be XYZ and he taught us to do this because it worked back in the whatever hundreds. Is there somebody that invented this system or was it purely accidental? Well, you know, empire, the idea of, of forming empires is as old as, you know, modern, uh, sort of modern history. It's as old as history, basically. Um, but the real turn happened in Iran in the early 1950s. So when Mossadegh that gets uh, elected president, and again, very much, much like Jaime Roldos, he ran on a platform that said, the oil companies, we need the oil companies here, but they've got to pay, pay a fair share of the profits they make in Iran to the Iranian people. And uh, the British and the Americans were the oil companies in play here, especially the British company, the company that became BP. Uh, and the British had no, did not have a relationship with Iran. So they called on the Americans and it was Eisenhower, or well, first it was Truman. Truman refused to get involved, and then Eisenhower became president. He got involved, and he tried to convince uh, Mossadegh to, uh, to change his ways. And, but it wasn't happening. Now, Eisenhower, you know, ex-military general, was very afraid of nuclear war with the Soviet Union. And Iran borders the Soviet Union. So he didn't want to send troops in because he was afraid that the Soviets would respond by sending their own troops in and it could escalate to a nuclear war. And so he got together his secretary of state and his head of CIA, who were the Dulles brothers, the infamous Alan and John Foster Dulles. And uh, they came up with this plan. And the plan was that they identified a CIA agent, a card carrying CIA agent named Kermit Roosevelt, who happened to be Teddy Roosevelt's grandson. And Kermit Roosevelt was sent off to Iran with literally with suitcases <laughs> filled with dollars and a few friends, a few you know, assistants. And they launched this huge campaign to discredit Mossadegh. And you know, they, they bribed the police, they bribed the hoodlums in the streets to go demonstrate in the streets, they bribed the press. They used this money to uh, convince the country 
that, or at least to, con <laughs> to convince our country, to convince the world in a way that, that this prime minister was very unpopular and that he was a Soviet puppet, that he was a communist. And of course, this is in, the, in a time in the early 50s when, when there was this huge clash between communism and capitalism, you know, the, the Cold War had really begun. Uh, and so there was this, and, and in the United States, huge amounts of press that 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 that, that, that was paid for, to 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 say that this guy had to be taken out, and so eventually he was overthrown, and it seemed like a legitimate coup against a guy who was evil to his country. This is this is you know the impression that was conveyed to the world, and the Shah of Iran was brought in as a CIA puppet basically, and placed on the throne, the peacock throne. And so, the, but this was so successful and it was so inexpensive, you know, a few suitcases filled with dollars is nothing compared to sending in troops. And it was so safe in terms of if, 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 uh, if it didn't work, then there probably wouldn't have been war. Who knows what would have happened to Kermit Roosevelt, but, but there wouldn't have been a war. We wouldn't have, we wouldn't have, there was no threat of nuclear war. That it, 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 it marked a turning point where successive uh, administrations in the United States could say, now, listen, uh, we don't have to go to war to exploit other countries. We can do it economically. There was one problem, and that was that Kermit Roosevelt was a card-carrying CIA agent. If he had been caught, it would have been very embarrassing for the CIA, for the U.S. government. So very shortly after that, the decision was made to use private consultants like me mm. to do the so uh, it would, wouldn't implicate the U.S. government. Got it. So this is why when you went to your NSA interview, they said you may we may not hire you, but you may work with one of the companies that we are in partnership with. Exactly. And that became uh, a very common practice. Now, let me ask you, how many times did the NSA throw companies like that under the bus saying we had nothing to do with it? We had no business with them. Was it pretty common practice to throw the companies under the bus once somebody screwed up? Well, we always knew that they they would do that. Uh, yeah. if, we screwed, if we screwed up, but I don't know how many that actually happened to yeah. because I think in general, uh, you know, we were pretty successful. People in my position were, were pretty successful because these the heads of states of these countries had damn few options, really. I mean, they, they, they knew the options. How many, a, no, go how, ahead. how many economic hitmen like you were there at the time in America? I don't know. I never okay. did know. I never did know. But what I do know and, and why I wrote uh, the follow-up to Confessions of an Economic Hitman 12 years later, the new Confessions, is because I, that, that whole species has grown so much over the years. And it's not only people like me who are kind of generic. We wanted to arrange deals that would help U.S. corporations. And we didn't really care whether Bechtel got the contract or Brown and Root or, or Halliburton or General Electric. We didn't really care who got the contract as long as we got a piece of the action and we made sure that we would get a piece of the action. But now, in addition to people like like that, who are still out there, uh, every major corporation has its equivalent of economic hitmen. So, you know, so whether it's it's uh, Raytheon or General Dynamics or uh, 3M or General Electric or Walmart, for that matter, they all have people that are going out into these countries and and trying to arrange better deals for their for their company. And you know, we see that so blatantly when a company decides that it's going to build, we, we even see it within the United States. So remember when Amazon was gonna you know, put in their next headquarters office, they, they got uh, nor Northern Virginia to vie with New York City. And what they were asking, they had these economic hitmen going in and telling, and telling, telling these cities, hey, look, you'll get a lot of employment here if we move our headquarters here or part of our headquarters here, but you gotta give us a big tax break and you gotta, you gotta give us a low uh, wage rates that we can deal with and so you don't think you don't think that's appropriate just to kind of put that you don't think that's an appropriate uh, thing to do for a company to say if i bring you twenty two thousand five hundred jobs at one hundred fifty thousand dollar your income give me some tax breaks you don't think that's the right thing to do is what you're saying well i think we have to be careful i, I think that I, 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 I i'm not sure there's a general rule but i think what we have to look at is what are the trade-offs and new york city actually won the contract with amazon and then decided that they weren't going to accept it because it was a bad deal for them so if you give the company such tax breaks but I they don't all think, i don't think new york city said no though i think aoc campaigned around it saying the fact that the rent's going to go up and both the blasio and uh 
uh, 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 what's the governor's name? Uh, Cuomo, but the Palacio Cuomo wanted it, but AOC's campaign drove Bezos away, and Bezos finally said, "I'm not going to put it here." So New York wanted it, but AOC kind of pushed them away. Well, yeah, who does AOC represent? You know, I mean, she... obviously she's a she's a, a a big supporter of the socialistic philosophy, and Cuomo and De Blasio kind of wanted those jobs in New York. And you would think that Cuomo and and Blasio would be more powerful than her, wouldn't you? Actually, I mean, they they they've got the big corporations behind them. I don't think so. I think because t t nowadays, you know, one of your talks you gave, which was very powerful, you said. Uh, uh, I don't know if it was your TEDx or I don't know which uh, uh, interview you did. You talked about the fact that the power people have today to send emails to companies to talk about the fact that, hey, let's do more social. Let's give back to community. Let's use our power and resources to send an email. People are listening nowadays. There's this thing, not email today called Twitter. Well, AOC has nearly 8 million Twitter followers. That's more than both of them combined times 10, you know, times uh, six. So you have to realize that it's it's different today. Just because you're a mayor of New York or governor of New York doesn't mean you have more influence than somebody that's a congressman with 8 million followers. One's got a bigger voice than the rest do. And is that democracy in the works? Um, I mean, it's called marketing to me. It's not democracy. I think, I think today, <laughs> yeah, there's always know, been a fine, there's always been a fine line there, hasn't there, between yeah. democracy no, no and question about it. marketing. In any case, I, you know, I don't know, you know who's right or wrong, but the point being, that, you know, do you bring a company in and offer them huge tax breaks, but at the same time, you give them huge benefits in terms of the school system, the fire departments, the police departments, the sewage systems, all these other things that the company benefits from, the, the airports, do, do they pay their fair share? And th that's a question I think every community has to ask, or ask itself. And we see the same thing in countries. So we've got a company going in and, and talking to Indonesia saying, hey, if you let us build our next plant here, uh, and we, we will build our next plant here if you'll give us big tax breaks. And if you don't, we'll go to the Philippines. And these countries you know, always have to look at this. And, and nine times out of 10, in my experience, it's the wealthy people who benefit. So you give the company the tax breaks and the wealthy people somehow end up getting the kind of deals that I described where their brothers get these contracts and their sister and so on and so forth. So, but I think, you know, that's why I say, I don't think there's a general answer to your question. I mean, tax breaks can be used very, very wisely, but they can also be a very corrupt form of, of uh, companies getting things for free that they probably should be paying for. And I also think, Patrick, an argument could be made to, let's not tax corporations at all. But let's let's really tax the people who benefit from them, the stockholders, especially the wealthiest stockholders, so to pay their fair share. I mean, there's there's so many different ways to look at this whole process of how do we how do we support our police forces and our fire departments and our hospitals and our schools and our utility companies? Who who pays who pays the price for these things? I mean, listen, we're going into a whole different conversation because if you if you think about that part, you know, I'd much rather have Amazon go to New York than go to D.C. Because if you go to D.C., that's the ultimate crony capitalism business model where you are now in the, you know, you you know what it costs to senators pass a law nowadays. I think it's $50,000 to $100,000. It doesn't cost that much money to do some of that. So, you know, if they right. go to New York and then I think from the governor's standpoint, like I moved my business from L.A. to here. OK, when I moved here, I brought all the jobs here. And, you know, every uh, raise, everything that we did, Texas got the benefit of the people that are living here, whether they bought homes, they get their kids sent to kids to private school, all the money they spent at the market, you know, gas, all of that stuff, Texas benefit from it, California lost from it, right? And you've seen a lot of that with Elon Musk just put his plant in um, uh, Austin. So I'm, I'm just thinking economically how that makes sense. For some states, I understand the benefit of having 22,500 jobs paid on an average of $150,000. Bring it to my city. I'd love to find a way to make it work with you if I'm a governor or mayor at that time. But going back to the business model you're talking about, it, it got me thinking. So one, find a country that's somewhat desperate, has resources. Number two, go in and make an offer with the corporation. Hey, World Bank lends us $4 billion. We're going to build infrastructure into your country. It's going to create a bunch of different jobs. Three, wink, wink, we'll take care of your kids, private school, all this other stuff that's going to happen. Four, if you don't do it, we're going to kill you. So the corporation business model is we're going to put you out of business. 
your business model that you had that you were working with is more the mafia business model because it could cost your life if you don't do it. Those six stories that you have. How much of that do you think is happening today with other countries doing it to America? Well, that's, a, that's an interesting question. Uh, can you be more specific? For example, you know, uh, I don't know, let me go in and I'm uh, China. You know, if you look at like 30 years ago, Russia was the enemy. Today, it's China's the enemy, okay? China's surpassed Russia as an enemy. And China comes in and says, hey, McConnell, I know your wife's uh, uh, father is uh, a very, very well-known billionaire in China. You know, we'll do this for you. Just kind of be a little bit lenient with us but we'll take care of you. Hey, uh, Biden, you know, if you allow us to do this one and a half billion dollar deal, we'll put your son on the board and pay you $50,000. It's a form of an economic hitman. That, that's what I'm saying. How much, is, how much of that is China studied what US did and now China's saying, we're gonna take you to a whole different level. Do you think China's using any of that economic hitman business model? You know, I, 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 I hate to speculate on stuff I don't really know, and I don't really know what's going on now in, in those terms in the United States, except what I read or, or hear. I I'm, I'm, I'm certainly would expect that China would be trying to do that, uh, because that's, that is part of the model. What I, what I do know is what China has been doing in, in Latin America, for example, where I still spend a lot of time. I, I spend a... a and uh, in a normal year, I spend two to three months in, in Latin America, in Ecuador, Colombia, Costa Rica, Guatemala, and many places. And I've seen in the Bahamas, I've seen how China is making huge inroads into these countries. Um, you know, China's playing the same game that we did in a way of making these, these huge loans. And it's got these two big banks, the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank and BRICS uh, Bank. That are that are outspending the World Bank, and getting very being very very successful at it, um, and China's been making a lot of mistakes. Uh, they built a huge dam in Ecuador that's got cracks in it because they built it on a fault line next to an active volcano. I mean, crazy stuff. There's a hotel that was built in in the Caribbean uh, that the Chinese built, and the pipes that the toilet pipes are all too small. I, I guess the Chinese people are smaller. So I don't know what the story is there, but they had to then completely replumb re the, the whole system. And they had to put, they couldn't go back in the wall. So they had to put the pipes on the outside of the walls. Huge, terrible mistake. You know, they've been making some big mistakes, but what China has done <clears throat> differently in the United States. And I, I, I asked, I, I asked my friends in high places and in some of the Latin American countries, why are you taking loans from China? Don't you think that they're they're going to do the same thing? That you, 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 that's coming out. We'd much rather take loans from China than the United States. And I'd say, but wait, aren't they after your resources too? And they say, yeah, they're after our resources. We don't have the technology to mine, to to drill for oil, to do these things. So we need outside company, uh, country to help us. And we know that the United States has a record of, of overthrowing our governments and assassinating leaders. We all know that. And of building military bases on our soil and of forcing us to vote against Cuba, the United Nations, doing things, exercising huge controls over us. And China hasn't done that. China's not built any military bases here. They've not taken out any of our presidents. They've not been involved in any coups. And so we'd prefer to take loans from them. So, and I'm not, I'm not defending what China is doing by any means because I think their motives are the same, but I will say that I think that they they may have learned from our mistakes, from the U.S.'s mistakes in, in being quite so blatant as we've been in some of these places. So they're very much using the same techniques that I used, except maybe they're not holding the gun up quite the same way. They're basically Oh, they're basically offering the money. And, you know, China has this long history of, of huge amounts of exploitation out into the world through commerce. Very seldom has it used military might, except in what it considers its own sphere of influence, which is, uh, which is uh, Tibet and uh, the, the South China Sea and, uh, and Taiwan. But it, it's 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 used the you know the Silk Road. It's used this 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 very commercial uh, form of exploitation uh, to create its own version of empire. So let me ask you: Who do you trust more yourself? You've been all over the world. You've represented U.S. You've dealt with a lot of different countries. Do you do you trust China more? Or do you trust U.S. more? 
politics. Well, I'm an American. I'm, a, I'm an American. I trust the United States. Uh, that I I'm, and I'm also sad that we made some of the mistakes that we made in the past that have put us in this position. That's one of the reasons I write the books I write. And why I'm talking to you because I think we've made some big mistakes and I, I think we need to really look at those mistakes and, and correct them. I think we should be the world leader. We should lead the world into democracy and a, a good form of capitalism. And uh, we have not done a very good, once the Soviet Union collapsed in 91, uh, we had an opportunity to really get out there and show the world how, how benevolent we could be, how how we could really set a model for the world. And we didn't do a very good job at it. And now the Chinese are stepping in and, and telling the world that they can do a better job. I don't think they can do a better job. I'm, I'm an American I want to, and I want to see us resume the leadership role and do it in a, in a way that it'll convince the rest of the world that our system is the best. John, how much are you following the election right now? How much are you following the story of the election right now going back and forth between Biden and Trump? Well, <laughs> Yeah, I'm following it. I don't know, you know, how how much. What do you mean? <laughs> how much can you follow? It's in the news. I listen to the news every day. And, and, well, but the reason why I'm asking that is because, it, you know, when I asked the question about McConnell and if there was a model of economic hitman being used for them, for Chinese to potentially try to win over McConnell or Biden, you kind of skim past through it. But you're somebody that this is like your cup of tea. This is your world. I mean, I would assume you'd be an expert to give us feedback to see if if let's just say China was uh, bringing a deal in of one and a half million dollars and investing and paying fifty thousand dollars a month to somebody's son, is that a model of an economic hitman? Yeah, is that a it is. So that is a model of an economic hitman. Yeah, if that's what's happening, yes, yeah, the same. It's very similar to the model that that I I did. What I was basically saying, Patrick, is you know I I, I like to have a lot of credibility and I think I do in, on, on, from all parties. I don't, I don't take a political stance and I, I intentionally, uh, I mean, I have my own politics, but I don't try to bring it in. I want to be, I talk about what I know, what I've experienced and what I was basically saying is right now, I'm not in that business. And so it's hard to comment on it. I can comment and, and I haven't had conversations with the leaders of the United States in, in quite a few years. I do have conversations fairly frequently with leaders of South America. I was just on a program the other day with the former president of Colombia and also with the former president of Ecuador. And I, I, I'm in conversation with <laughs> leaders in other countries much more than I am with my own country. So, so uh, okay, so at the same time, you know, one thing that makes you very interesting is when you speculate what happened with a, uh, I think John F. Kennedy, you've speculated that John F. Kennedy could potentially be an inside job, right? Like meaning the assassination was possibly done from the inside yes or you don't have any speculation with john f kennedy well no i don't have any speculation i i only read the what the papers say what we've heard and 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 the u.s congress and a joint com commission uh ruled against the idea that there was one assassin on the other hand i guess it was the fbi rule that there was one assassin i don't pretend to know I think there's always that possibility. I think there's always that possibility that might, there might have been more to it than we than we know. But I certainly don't have any reason to suspect otherwise, personally. Got it. And and have you ever commented on MLK if MLK was potentially assassinated uh, or no? Any thoughts on that with your experience? Martin Luther King. Yeah. Well, he obviously was assassinated. Was it an inside job? Oh. No, I don't think I've ever speculated. I don't speculate on that. I have no idea. Got it. No, I, you know, I, I wonder because, you know, sometimes you sit there and you, you read these stories. You know, I, I was born in Iran and I sometimes wonder Shah's exodus. How much of that? You hear the, uh, the stories of both sides. You know, on one end, Carter comes in, toast, leaves. The revolution begins. They bring somebody from France, Paris that was exiled twice, Khomeini, he lives over there, he's sending these text tapes, they're spreading. 12 months later, the momentum gets very high, you know, let's blame Savak, no, let's blame the Mullahs, no, let's blame, you know, the Shah, no, let's blame Khomeini's people. And then there's a Cinema Rex fire, which I'm sure you remember, where 400 people were in a theater in Abadan, and all these guys, folks die, and know with Savak is there, no cops right across the street, whose fault was it? And then some say America caused the revolution in Iran, and some say the people of Iran were just sick of it. 
from your experience of having been around a lot of those people, what would you say your opinion on what happened with Iran with the end of Shah's regime? Well, first of all, I was shocked at what happened in Iran. And my own personal experience was one night I'm sitting in the, the Tehran Hilton, uh, sorry, uh, the Intercontinental in Tehran at the, at the bar. Uh, I was staying there and I'm sitting at the bar and I get a tap on the shoulder and I turn around and there's a man behind me who I recognize. And it's Fahar, the guy who I went to Middlebury College with and got in the knife Soccer. <laughs> incidentally. Yeah. He got expelled uh, for being in that knife fight. Uh, they, did, they did pin it on him, I, even though I denied it. Um, and uh, he, he taps me on the shoulder and he's standing behind me. And I haven't seen him in, in, in many years, so well over 10 years. Uh, he's gained a lot of weight, uh, but I recognize him. And, and we, 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 chat, chat, we, 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 we just chat for a few minutes. And then he said, John, I've got a ticket here in my hand. You're flying out with me on, on Air France tomorrow morning at 5 a.m. to, to uh, Rome. And I said, well, well, no, I've got a meeting tomorrow with a, somebody, somebody very high up in the Shah's administration. And he said, no, you're not, you're going with me to Rome. You, you, we're going to go and stay at my dad's house. And I said, well, your dad is a, is a general in the Shah's army. He's here. He's not in Rome. And, and Fahad said, no, he's, he's always had a house in Rome. He's kept it and he's, he's, he's living there now. He's, he's left around permanently and you're coming with me. And, and I got on the plane with him the next morning and it was the next day, all that next week that the things erupted in Iran, that the beginning of the revolution happened. And I never, and, and I went and I stayed at, 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 uh, at uh, the general's house in Rome for a couple of days. And, and uh, you know, I said, so what's going on? He said, well, the Shah has lost it. He's, he's out, he's, he's never gonna make it. And, he, and, and, and this guy said, I think the Shah has uh, lost his mind to a certain degree. He's not, he's not the guy he used to be. And, you know, I never really understood what went on because from my perspective, and most everybody that I knew that was working in Iran, the Shah was very popular. You know, his picture was everywhere. He, he and, the, and the Princess Farah, that, 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 that his wife, that, that, that their pictures were everywhere and people seemed to really love them. And we, we thought they did. And, and she was sponsoring international tennis tournaments and, and film festivals and bringing a lot of culture to the country. Um, and uh, we had this impression. And so I was shocked, totally shocked. But you know, over the years, people pointed out to me that all the information I ever got in Iran came from people, Iranians who spoke English, who were mainly educated in the United States or England. And they all worked for the Shah ultimately, you know, <laughs> one form or another. All, so whenever I was out interviewing people who didn't speak English, I had interpreters there with me who spoke English. So you know, it was portrayed to me that I didn't really understand the tremendous undercurrent against the Shah. I don't know whether it was there or not. I've been told I just didn't see it or hear it because I, I wasn't privy to that information. Unlike in Latin America, where I could always hear the undercurrent of some of the anti-Americanism that was going on there, some of the fear of exploitation, because I, I'm fluent in Spanish. So I could talk to you know, street sweepers. I could talk to you know, carpenters and people of the street. It wasn't just that I didn't have to do anything through an interpreter. I didn't have to do anything through an interpreter. So there's a big difference. So in Iran, we, I, I was very much blindsided. And I think most everybody was. I mean, companies lost a lot of money. My own company lost a lot of money. It was interesting, Patrick, that my company, Charles T. Main, in all these countries where we worked, we, we usually were paid by the World Bank or one of those organizations. So we didn't worry about getting paid. The money came directly to us from the World Bank. It never went to Colombia or Guatemala or Ecuador. That they, they signed off on the loan, but the money went directly from the World Bank to our banks. Interesting. And so we didn't worry. The one country where we, that owed, and, and if countries did owe us money, we insisted on being paid before we produced the report. So we'd go in and do the work, and then we'd have a report that they wanted, but we wouldn't give it to them until we get paid. Iran was the one exception. We trusted Iran. We trusted the Shah. And so... Uh, my company lost a lot of money uh, after the coup, after the overthrow, after the coup, after the overthrow of the Shah, uh, and uh, you know, so we were totally blindsided. I mean, we just didn't have any idea. We thought the place was safe. It was it was a very interesting thing as I as I look back on it to think of how how naive 
we were a guess. And then again, I don't know. Was there a big undercurrent? I, I, I still don't know. You know what what the story is. And it's. I mean, it's been thirty years since this, since the event happened. Mm -hmm. you, you even hear CIA reports saying the fact that uh, there was involvement with U.S. wanting to get him to fall, and uh, uh, for the Shah to have a fall. So you read a lot of different stories. I just thought maybe if you had been involved in that, maybe you would have certain well, I, things that we don't have. I can't imagine that they wanted the mullahs to take over. Like, I, I just can't see you know, how that served any U.S. interest. Could, yeah, do you? Yeah, but, but yes, because at that time, there was an element of uh, them being more reasonable and the Shah was getting a little too powerful in the in the world and they were getting ready to pass UK and UK used to own the, uh, you know, Anglo Persian oil company that turns out to become, you know, you know, this BP years later. And back in the days, they used to own 90% of it. And Iran didn't have a clue what to do. And the Shah renegotiated the deal and took it over and they owned the oil. So then Iran became super powerful. Education got better. Things got better. Frank Sinatra used to party over there. Everybody used to go over there. Elizabeth Taylor used to date Zahedi. All these things happened to Iran, and Iran became a place where rich people would go to, and some people weren't happy about it. And let's face it, the Shah of Iran got a little bit uh, too confident, and a couple interviews again with BBC said that the blue-eyed people are taking too many sleeping medicines. I don't know if you remember that interview or not when that took place. And uh, he said, within five years, we'll be the size that you are. And within 25 years, we'll be competing with other Western companies. And he had a smirk on his face when he said that. It's almost a method of competition we're coming after. And I don't know if politicians like that, because the more turmoil in the Middle East, the more control. The less turmoil, the more control. You know, it's, 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 a, it's, a, um, it's an interesting dynamic of what happened. I just thought maybe you had insight that maybe we didn't have. Yeah, and, and it's also interesting that, that this guy who was very close to the Shah, but my friend's father, who had been a, who was a general um, and, and close to the Shah, you know, said that he thought the Shah was losing it mentally, that he was, you know, he was he was losing it. He had dementia or something. And of course, we know he had cancer. So, yeah, it's uh, it's very very complex, but it's always been it's always been mind-boggling to me to try to understand exactly what happened and how. You know, if the CIA wasn't involved in the overthrow of the Iran, then how could the CIA have been so blindsided? It's one thing for me to be blindsided. I don't speak Farsi, but people in the CIA certainly did. They certainly had operatives. They certainly had access to Savak, the, 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 the Shah's very brutal secret service. The CIA was deeply involved with Savak, or had been. Uh, so CIA it's, trained the Savak. CIA okay. actually trained Savak, yeah. yeah. Exactly. Yeah. The Savak was almost All the like brutal a, methods Savak learned from CIA, which is a interesting who tra trained them, you know. Well, yeah, and that's true, you know, so throughout the Americas too, Latin America, where you had the school yeah. of the Americas. But yeah, so it's it's hard to believe that the CIA was really blindsided the way we business people were, but um, I, I just don't know. I wish I knew more. Did you ever have a face to face with the Shah or no? Just to, did you ever have a chance to meet him? Yes, I met him. It was always with other people. It was not a one-to-one -one sort of meeting like I had with Roldos and, and Torrijos in Latin America. Uh, it, was, it, was a, it was group things, but yeah, I, I certainly met him and shook his hand and, you know. Did you, ever, did you ever deal with Zahedi or no? His uh, ambassador, U.S. ambassador, Zahedi? No. Or Zahedi? No. You never dealt with him? No. You know, uh, for me, for a guy that was born there, I had my family who, one side, they were two-day. I don't know if you remember what two-day community is. Do you remember the yeah. two-day? Okay, they were the communists, which uh, a lot of time Mossadegh was linked to because Mossadegh was more like a modern-day Bernie Sanders. You know, he was more of a socialist, and he kind of wanted to, he didn't like the fact that Shah's family got rich because of oil and all this other stuff. And so there was a community that didn't like... Uh, the Shah and a lot of the people in Iran getting rich. And then you had the other side that was loving how Iran was growing and expanding and reinvesting. And so just like any other, I mean, you're seeing some of that in America right now. You look at America right now, there are a lot of people that are not happy with America creating a lot of wealth. Every time you hear somebody become a millionaire, it's almost like you have to keep it a secret. Are you a millionaire? No, 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 I'm not. No, Michael Moore, don't, don't ever say I'm worth $50 million. I'm broke. I'm just a regular guy. I know I made a video about this. You're seeing all of these people in America today that are embarrassed to say that they're living the American dream, where at one point it used to be like 
the ultimate goal. You come to America to live the American dream. And there was some of that going on with Iran. Uh, I ask because, uh, you know, I got family. I'm raising my kids here. I want to make sure that doesn't happen in the country I've chosen to live in uh, uh, to see what's going on here. So, you know, just out of curiosity for someone like you, what do you think is the biggest threat America has today? We have a lot of different things that we're hearing about. You're hearing about bio warfare, cyber attack. You know, you're hearing about proxy wars, China, tariffs, Brexit, Venezuela, oil, Maduro, the border. You know, all of these things that's going on for someone like you that some tells me you're not you're not saying everything that you know, because you, you kind of want to also you don't want to say the wrong thing to piss off the wrong person. I kind of get a feeling you kind of hold them back a little bit, which is fine. I can respect that. But let's see if we can get an answer from you, from someone that has experience for the rest of us to uh, 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 kind of position ourselves better. What do you think is the biggest threat today to America? I think it's I think I think it's us. I, I think the, the the divisions that have occurring in this country, the fact that our 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 Congress seems to be you know still stalemate right now. We've we've got this you know the the, the Democrats and Republicans fighting over what are we going to do with the six hundred dollars a week? What's what, what's next? What are we? And so so nothing happens, and you know I, I I'm, I'm terribly concerned with the way that we budget things. So for example. You know, fifty-four dollars of every hundred dollars you pay in taxes, all right, and the American who pays U.S. taxes, fifty-four dollars out of every hundred in the discretionary budget goes to the military, and the the military is spending a hell of a lot of money on aircraft carriers and other things that are kind of outdated in this time of, of drones and cybernetics. The Chinese, the Russians, they're spending their money. They spend a lot less. You know, we spend, our military budget is, is as large as the next 10 countries combined. And we're spending it on things that give basically pork barrel to every state. Every state has benefits from the big military budget. So every, every congressperson wants to keep the budget growing and keep it making stuff that's to a large degree outdated. I wish we'd spend a lot more money on cybernetics. I think our threat is from China and Russia is not from aircraft carriers, it's, it's from cybernetics. It's from attack on our voting system. It's from the, the tremendous campaigns that we know they've been launching over social media to bias people in this country and to undermine our election process. I, I wish we'd spent a lot more money on that sort of stuff, but instead we, we quibble over these ancient methods. And, and I think also um, that somehow, how do we come together to get out of this divisiveness? Because this divisiveness is hurting us. It's, it's uh, you know, I, I actually fear that we could result in some sort of really strong clash. I, I don't want to use the word civil war because that conjures up, you know, the, the trench warfare of the, of the civil war of the 1800s. But I think we're going through a very deep divide right now, which is dangerous to us. And the world sees this. Countries like Russia and China China, who there's no doubt in my mind, they want to take over. They're in the process of, China's in the process of taking over. And they see these incredible weaknesses and they know how to go in and exploit these weaknesses. And they do it to a very large degree through technology, uh, you know, computer technology, AI technology, cybernetics. Um, so I think our threat, the biggest threat to us is that we're not keeping up to date. We're not staying in tune with where the world really is today. Uh, we need to be really, really careful around China, especially China, also Russia, but especially China. And I don't think we're playing it very smart in the way that we're dealing with China. I think we're dealing with China like it was some, you know, like we're, like, the, like we're dealing in the time of World War II. Well, this isn't the time of World War II. This isn't even the time of the Vietnam War, or the Korean War. This is a time where we've reached an exponential increase in the power of technology and the power of AI and the power of of social networking. And I don't think we're keeping up with it. And that bothers me, concerns me a great deal. So uh, so what, what do you mean by we're not dealing with China properly? How would you deal with China? How would you have handled it? Well, I, for one thing, I would strengthen our own abilities to protect ourselves from cyber attacks, uh, from virus attacks, put, put more emphasis on our, on our healthcare systems, on, on our social networking systems, on our educational systems. You know, to really bring our people up to date to, uh, as to what's going on in the world. I don't think we're doing a good job of, of really keeping people informed of, of what the real threats are here. 
when do you think is the last time we did a good job at those things? Hmm. I think we started making the mistakes when the Soviet Union collapsed in 91, detente. I think at that time, we became rather arrogant. We were the world's only superpower suddenly. So up until that time, we'd been competing with the United States. We kept pretty sharp. Uh, I mean, we'd been competing with the Soviet Actually, Union. Yeah. We, 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 we kept pretty sharp. Once the Soviet Union collapsed, we kind of just, I think, focused on, on materialistic gain and, and spreading corporations, exploiting other countries, rather than really keeping up on things. And then, you know, China took a huge advantage of the period when we went into Afghanistan, uh, went into Iraq and then Afghanistan. So after 9-11, I think one of the biggest benefits for 9-11 was China. Uh, and I'm not suggesting China did 9-11, I'm just suggesting that they knew how to take advantage of the United States. Suddenly, up until that time, we'd been watching China. We'd been careful about our trade deals with China. But after 9-11, we were so focused on Iraq and Afghanistan and the Middle East that we, we kind of lost track of China. And during that time, China just rose up. I mean, it, 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 tr it truly rose up and, be, and is now the, you know, uh, the, the, another superpower. There's no question about it. We're not alone anymore. We're not the sole superpower. So I think we, we blew it during that period when we had a tremendous opportunity to, to really influence the entire world with our, and, and bring our systems to bear on the, on the world in, in, in a good way. So when's the last time we did it right? All those things you talked about, because that's when we did it wrong. So essentially you're saying Reagan, but when did we do it right? Well, that's a tough question to answer because I'm not sure you can ever say anybody ever did it completely right, but we came out of World War II as the world's hero and as a, an example to be followed, a leader, the leadership area to be followed. And it, you know, there was a there was a whole process during the next years where I think where where I think that we, we we moved in that direction. I think the Vietnam War was a big mistake uh, because that also pissed off a lot of the world, and in the end showed the world that that we couldn't that, that our form of warfare failed against a, a different kind of warfare. Um, and you know, it's interesting, Patrick. I think it was it was after v Vietnam. But during this period, so when I was an economic hitman, that, that the whole decision was made, warfare like that doesn't work. So let's expand our, our, our way of dealing with the world through economic hitmen. So we, we lose in Vietnam, mid-70s. Mid, mid and after that, the whole emphasis was on doing things the way that I'd done things, through economics, through that kind of a process of loans, of building up countries, of, of going in with the infrastructure. But it reached a point, I, I think, in the late 1990s, during the time of Clinton, when the people, many corporations had gained from this economic hitman era, but the military industrial complex, as Eisenhower defined it, uh, hadn't gained. It was losing. It wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't doing what it wanted to do and was putting tremendous pressure. I think they put a lot of pressure on Clinton. I think then 9-11 came along and it gave the perfect excuse to go back in and gear up to the military process. So since 9-11, uh, we've, we've had both things going on. There's been the, the military approach and also the economic hitman approach has continued. But, it, but during that process, as I mentioned earlier, because we put such a huge emphasis on the wars in the Middle East, we lost sight of China. We forgot that China was the rising dragon that's, you know, and now we're suddenly, you know, we woke up, we wake up and we look around and we say, oh my God, what's happened? They're taking over. What are we going to do about it? You know, trade embargoes and so on and so forth. What are we going to do about it? So, so what do you say to the folks where like, you know, what you're saying right now, I had a lot of people here that read your book because it's, uh, it's fascinating what you're writing about. And it kind of, I believe there's a lot of it going on today. And you got a lot of people speculating, saying this economic hitman job, China's mastering. And what do you say to those that they had a president like Trump, who is the most difficult person to person China's dealt with, keeps putting tariffs on top of tariffs on top of tariffs on top of tariffs. 
And China did the ultimate economic hit job, which is the world economic hit job by releasing a virus that got into all these other countries. And trillions of dollars was lost uh, around the world based on a virus like that. Do you think there is any chance, any chance that a part of that virus had to do with an economic hitman's job philosophy that you have to say, you don't want to negotiate with us, you're strong arming me, watch what I'm, gonna, what I'm gonna do to you. Do you think any chance of that could take place with what happened recently with coronavirus? My personal opinion, no. Why is that? Because China suffered from it too. I think the United States made huge mistakes. If, if China wanted to, to show us as a country that's really failed in taking care of its people, it certainly succeeded in that. You know, a country with less than 5% of the world's population has about 25% of the coronavirus deaths. That's, that's unacceptable. That's ridiculous. The largest economy in the history of the world and we can't take care of our people. Mm -hmm. So the virus certainly showed our weaknesses up. So if China had wanted to do that, they've certainly succeeded. But it's really difficult for me to believe that, that uh, anybody would create a virus like that and have it hit their own country and, and spread around the world. Anything's possible. I know that from, from, from my own experiences. There's always stories behind the story. So there's always that possibility. I would never say never, but in my opinion, I think that's extremely unlikely. I think it, you know, and people like, like Bill Gates had, 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 had prophesied, had projected that there would be a virus like five or six years ago. He said, this is likely to happen. Many medical authorities have said, that it was bound to happen at some point. We were, we were poorly prepared for it. And I, in my opinion, we've, uh, our national government has, has, has made a terrible job of dealing with the situation. Got it. You know, I mean, if, if you're saying the fact that, you know, uh, a, a country with 5% of the world population has 25% of death, that means China doesn't have that many deaths, which means it kind of worked out for them, right? If, if it was, because it didn't really hurt them as much as you're saying it hurt America. It destroyed America if it's like a quarter of all the death that took place based on the data that you're saying. So that means it could be possible that they did do it and it was victorious for them, no? Yeah, Thailand's done really well too. They've had even fewer deaths because they've got such a good healthcare system. So it's possible that Thailand created the, the virus and planted it in a Chinese factory. Anything China, like China possible. Said, I mean, the, fact, the fact of the matter is you could say that about almost every country because the one that's done most poorly is the United States. So I think- well, no, I'm only saying it to you because you are the guy that wrote the book, Economic Hit yeah. Shop, which, is, which, which gets us who live in America to sit there and say, if America did it to so many people, maybe China's now retaliating and doing it the ultimate way. I don't know. I'm, well, I'm not the one that's speculating. I'm just well, wait, a minute, wait, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. We we never created a virus. We never did anything. No, I never said virus. I never like, said virus. like that. I mean, it's I never one said thing. warfare. I never said bio warfare. I just said the model of an economic because everybody when you read the you know business model of China. The U.S., you, you make a very good point when you say 54% were investing into buying ships and buying this and buying that. What for? How much of that war is really taking place today? Why don't we spend some of that money into protecting ourselves in a different military way, cybersecurity, all this other stuff? Very, very accurate statement you're making. Absolutely. The right people, I'm hoping, listen to this and realize maybe we need to go in the direction what you're talking about. You know, the next war is not going to be the war that we're accustomed to seeing from the 70s and 80s and World War II or World War I. We're seeing the bio-warfare can destroy economies and shut down an entire nation. And the one country that's always bragged about being the best in that is in America. It's always been China. So that's why a part of this speculation, when you come in and in the middle of the interview, my brain just went, wait a minute, if that's, what if there, you know, it could be a possibility. I don't know, people have brought it up to me. Let me just ask John, since he's the expert here. So, and, and the other part is, you know, the, the com complete, opposite argument of the 5% of world's population, US, 300 million of 7.5 billion, yet 25% of the death. That's also assuming, John, that the data China has given the world is accurate, no? True, true. It does assume that. You're right. It's tough to trust the nation that doesn't have free press. It is. You're right. No, that's, I don't trust China. I'm not saying that I, that I trust China, but I am, I think what, if you look historically, countries that wage war in other countries usually want to have pretty good control over their weapons. It's one of the reasons that countries fear nuclear weapons, because we fear that we don't really have that much control. Once you set off the nuclear reaction, 
who knows where that's going to go. So that, you know, based on history, it, it's hard for me to believe that you release a virus around the world and you don't have much control over it. You don't know who it's going to hit. And so to me, you know, I'm not saying that biological warfare can't happen or, or isn't happening. P possibly it is, but if it is, we're in, we're in really, really deep trouble. Uh, and does, it, does that mean we should retaliate with our own biological weapons? No, not at all, zero. What does it mean? No, not at all. I don't think that's so let's what it say, Let's say that we, we, actually, we actually proved that China did do this. What would be our response? I'd be curious to know what you say to because I have my own ideas. What would you do to it? If, if it's proven that this did happen and you know the, we take him to the tribunal and we put him on court, everybody does the investigation, everything happens. Yep, they started it, they released it, they knew what's happening and it caused shambles around the, around the world. What do you think needs to happen to China? That anybody could do, I can't possibly imagine. I really can't, Patrick. What do you think? <laughs> I got to tell you, I'm learning how you sat down with these prime ministers and presidents. And by, I hope all the audience is taking notes. I mean, have you, have you noticed how phenomenal yeah, yeah. he is? First of all, you're a January 28th baby, which which I'm I'm putting all the pieces together. Are you January 28th? I'm thinking you're January 28th. No, that's true. What does that mean? I just, I'm a math guy and, you know, I'm a, I got a weird side of me of putting pieces <laughs> of puzzle together. Forget about that part. But for me, I put numbers together. But uh, yeah, I have my own ideas what I would do. But uh, in, like I said, John, I'm an entrepreneur. What do I know? I'm just a regular guy. You know, I'm a, I'm a guy that's an insurance guy. I'm a business guy. I'm sitting down with the man that sat down with prime ministers and presidents. I'm asking you with your intellect. You went to school with a killer GPA. You killed it with all your grades. And you were somebody that wanted to prove a point that you can beat these rich kids in grade. You embarrassed them with your grades. You're the smart one here. I'm just a regular guy here. So yeah. what, you've, been, you've made a hell of a lot more money than I have. You've been a lot more successful in business than I have. And incidentally, I'm not an economist anymore. I haven't been an economist for years. I write, I write books on Jaguars. I write books that, you know, this is about transforming fear into actions to change your life in the world. It's no longer, I confessed about being an economic hitman, but I haven't been one for a long, long, long time. I don't pretend to know much about that world now. I'm writing about how we transform these things. And I think, you know, what we really need to look at now, Patrick, is that, that we have created an economic system that's causing a lot of problems. It's causing climate change. The, 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 the glaciers are melting. The polar bears are out there standing on single ice, icebergs. The oceans are rising. Species are going extinct. Uh, there's, you know, there's, there's, the, 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 the income inequality is huge. And you know, what we've really done is we've created an economic system that's, that's consuming itself into extinction, what I call a death economy. And we've got to look at that. And it's very, very likely that, that most of our problems are, like even the coronavirus, all the, the racial issues, Come on. Are, they're, they're all problems, but they're not the problem. They are symptoms of the problem. And the, the problem is a, is a system that we have created globally, a governmental social economic system that puts way too much emphasis on short-term maximization of consumption, materialistic consumption. And in the process, our industries are consuming the very resources that they depend on for the long run. They're consuming those things in the short run. They're doing whatever it takes to maximize short-term profits. I'm sure you're doing the same thing. I'm sure you're, you're, you're guilty. You know, you're, you're in that business, short-term profits. But you know what? Historically, that's never worked. Historically, the successful societies, and, and we've all been part of those for the last 250,000 years or so, most all those years, People have looked at, well, how do we take care of our kids and our grandchildren? How do we take care of the long run resources? Whereas today, it's this short term. Well, I mean, if you, if you study, if you study the, uh, the business model, and Bob, I'm going to still come back to the China question for you. So that was good for you to digress, but I'm going to come back and ask it from you one more time. So brace yourself emotionally, get ready to <laughs> what you're going to say, because I'm coming back. I'm not teasing you, I'm preparing you. Because <laughs> you're brilliant, I want to hear. I, Jaguar. I got my Jaguar, I got my Jaguar protecting, protecting me here. 
<laughs> I'm ready. I'm ready for this Chinese. Going back to going back to what you're saying, you know, I have I have to, you know, we have to realize that, you know, John, you're brilliant. You're not, you know, you're not saying what you're saying because you're you, you you've been around and you've studied a lot of different data. But you know, if you know business models, you know Amazon, the biggest criticism Bezos got for the longest time is because his shareholders used to complain that he didn't pay out dividends. And they used to say, how come we're not getting any dividends? Why are your profit margins so low? Why are your profit? And Bezos is like, dude, I'm not stalling for profit today. If you're patient with me, we're going to do big things. So when he first started a company, he went to 20, uh, uh, 40 different people and he raised $50,000 a piece, which is $2 million. Those people that gave $2 million, he gave them 20% of the company. That $2 million that was 20% of the company is worth $200 billion today. Okay. So he came and he says, I'm not going after profit. I'm going from value. Like for myself, I'm not the highest paid guy in the company. I've not been the highest paid guy in the company at all because I wasn't taking profits. I was rebuilding value, 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 infrastructure, putting back, putting back, putting back, putting back. And then it led to what it led to. And, and God knows how much money we've given back to charities and different kinds of foundations and things we've done. So pure business model doesn't work if you chase profit. Long term, it only works if you chase value and then you have an infrastructure. And then you, of course, you have a lot of power at that time. You and I both know like today when people talk about who's got the power in America, is it politicians or large corporations? Who would you say? It's an easy answer. Politicians or corporations? Who's got the power in America? Corporations. There you go. I, I, I don't think anybody disputes that. That's why there's crony capitalism. It's very right. ugly what's going on with all these guys buying people behind closed doors. But I'm going to go back to the question. If wait, wait, let me let me let me respond to what you said for just sure, a moment. Okay. Sure. Yeah. So I think I would dispute with you the, the your description of that model because I think Bezos and I suspect you did make huge profits, made huge profits in certain sectors of the business and plowed those rather than taking those profits or claiming them as profit, they were profits, but he plowed them back into buying other businesses. And I don't know whether you did that or not, but I know no. Bezos did that. He, no, he, he went and bought more and more businesses. He was making profits, but he was also plowing those profits into other businesses. The one now, what I'm saying is he didn't take it out. Like to say all he cares about is taking a profit side. The guy was yeah. trying to build an empire and compete against the bigger guys. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah, Sm smoke and mirrors. No profits. <laughs> yeah, no, but, we're just but, gonna, we're going to sink them into the long term to increase value. I'm st that's smart. I'm not saying it's not smart. It's smart, but it, it's, would a be doing it's a little misleading. It's a little misleading to say that his businesses didn't make profits. No, it wasn't. It wasn't known as the biggest EBITDA profit margins in place. There's more bigger margins in other businesses that they could take. Well, that's true. Through. That's true of Amazon.com, but a lot of the other businesses that that, that have spun off from that. You're right. Reason. I don't. I don't. I don't dispute. Listen, I'm not sitting here. Ter I, for one of my questions I had on the list was how do we fix crony capitalism? That was one of my questions I had for you. I was curious to know what you would say, because I don't think the left nor the right has figured out a way to uh, to solve crony capitalism, and I I think it's happening on both sides. So. Since you're the chief economist and former economic hitman, how would you fix crony capitalism today? Or is well, it, are we in too deep that we can't fix it? No, I never think we're in too deep. I, okay. I, you can't believe that. Uh, I, I think crony capitalism is a reflection of that guy sitting over your, your left shoulder there with the glasses on and the red necktie. Interesting that he's wearing a red necktie. What do you think that symbolizes? <laughs> Just I mean, it's the same reason why this guy's wearing a blue necktie and that guy's wearing a blue necktie. <laughs> I, I don't think know. what symbolizes is the fact that this guy's just saying, I'm not wearing any color. I'm just <laughs> the leader. That's, this is the guy I'm curious about. Yeah, so Milton Friedman over there, over, over your left shoulder, um, you know, this has been growing for a long time, but when he won the Nobel Prize in 1976, you know, the, probably the most important statement he made, and I'm paraphrasing here, is the only responsibility of business is to maximize short-term profits regardless of the social and environmental costs. And that really created crony capitalism, if you want to go there, because what it does is it tells every CEO that they, that they have, it tells every CEO that you've not only got the right, but you've got the mandate to do whatever it takes to maximize short-term profits, inclu including including buying politicians, which now is done legally because they pass the laws to make it legal. But it's still what you're calling crony capitalism, including forming monopolies, monopsonies, and and and, and including destroying 
the very resources upon which your business depends in the long term. The idea of maximizing short term anything is contrary to most life as we know it on this planet. I think you I think in slang terms they would say John Perkins you're reaching right now. Yes? You're you're out of pocket is what they would say. Okay? The, but the proper the, the but who the, would say that? But the, You'd but, say that. Who would say but, that? But the but maybe the the term that may be making sense is it's a little bit of spinning going on there. The guy said the number one job meaning like uh, the interpretation was your job is to make profit. You're not you are not forced to it's like saying Hey, you better give 10% to church. No, no, I'm going to choose to give 10% to church. You can't force me to give 10% to church. I'm going to give to charity. You can't force me to give. You can force me to pay taxes, which is what a lot of politicians do, but you can't force me to give my profits. I got to make sure I stay in business. So I understand that part. I don't think he was saying go buy politicians. That's not what he was saying, but that's maybe no, what that's some not, people. That's not what he was saying, but that's how yeah, it was interpreted. Can't. That's well, how it's that's, been interpreted. We have, so this is. This is almost like biblical studies, and, and we're reading one scripture from Galatians 1 6, and your interpretation is one thing, and my interpretation is another thing, and the viewers have to decide for themselves. Some are going to no, say, see, Patrick, you're full of it. Given that you grew up in Iran, you're probably a Zoroastrian, right? I am a, uh, so I grew up atheist for 25 years. My parents were both uh, Christian. And 25 years later, after going and studying Jehovah Witness, Seven Day, Judaism, Christianity, Scientology, all this stuff, the closest thing I felt that worked for me was non-denominational Christian. That's where I'm at. That's where I'm at. It's a little bit of a strange dynamic here. By the way, I was a diehard atheist. Diehard atheist. When you live in Iran and you see people dying and getting bombed on, it's very hard to believe in a God, especially a loving God. Very hard. So, again, you're talking to a very weird person here, John. It's... Not as well, weird I, as you. I'm, I'm not reached your level. I'm I, not. I, I, I was going to say, Patrick, that's the one thing we'd probably agree on. <laughs> it's, but it's, let me it, get back to my question. I'll ask the last question. If, if China really, it, if what? China, if China really did do what we talked about earlier, honestly, what should be the punishment if if that really did take place? I suppose the, you know, ideally speaking, the world gangs up on China and does everything possible to impose sanctions, to impose everything um, on China. Uh, but it would have to be a, a, a unified effort of the whole lot of most of the world. And I, I'm not sure that would happen. I don't know. I don't know how. I don't know how that goes, because I think so much of the world economy today depends on China, including the U.S. economy. Yeah. I mean, without China, what happens to our economy? Eighty percent of pharmaceutical is uh, relying yeah. on China. Eighty percent. Yeah, yeah and high tech, high tech. I mean, you talk. We talked yeah. about Amazon. We talk. You talk about uh, you know Apple. <laughs> what happens to them without China? So. I, 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 not, I think ideally, I think whatever the idealistic response to this is, frankly speaking, I suspect that if the NSA or, the, or MI6 or anybody discovers that China caused this virus, they would do everything they could to keep it secret because the, the, the implications to answer the question, if it became public that China did this, What's the correct response? Is probably a, a response that would be almost e suicidal economically for everybody. So that's a very, very difficult question you've asked. And I have a feeling that we will never prove that China did this if they did. And as I said earlier, I doubt they did, but I, I don't know. I don't know whether they did or not. But if they did, what is the correct response? response and, and so I throw it back at you you said you had a response what, what would your response be I don't know if I would ever uh, accept anybody traveling from China to here nor to any other country that accepts travel from China or any other country that accepts travel from a country that accepts travel from China I don't know if you understood what I just said those three different steps that I just covered right there I would, and number two what I would do is uh, if we're going to negotiate and you want me to get rid of the tariffs you need to allow every single country to have press in your country and allow every major social media company of U.S. to have freedom of being used by your citizens, which means uh, U.S. BBC is in China. NBC, CNN, Fox is in China. MSNBC in China. 
you know, ABC, every one of these guys are in China. And uh, F Facebook, YouTube, Twitter is in China. That's what I would be doing or else I'm just not negotiating the deal with you because I have to, nowadays, they're calling them citizen journalists, right? These are people that are walking out with a phone and it's Facebook Live and you can't see what's going on. Citizen journalists are almost more powerful today than the people working at CNN, Fox, and uh, MSNBC because you're seeing it right there with a 22-year-old kid holding a cell phone. If we got 1.5 billion Chinese citizens that have access to a cell phone that's on Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, and I can see exactly what's going on, then maybe we can renegotiate. Outside of that, they're going to be paying some fines. And I would probably cut the U.S. debt that they have. And I would say that forgiveness needs to come through because we're not paying you the $1.06 trillion of debt that we owe you. You cost us more, more than that. That's what I would do. But uh, again, I'm just an entrepreneur. So, 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 Patrick, if you did that, do you think you'd still have a cell phone? Yes, I would. Where would it come from? U.S. I just would have to pay 50% more to it. You got to realize... You, you think, well, well, wait a minute. China owns most of the mineral mines, uh, the minerals that are necessary to go into that cell phone are owned by China so, right now. So the difference between two of us is I believe in capitalism tremendously. I just don't believe in crony capitalism. And, and the model of capitalism that I believe in, the model of capitalism that I believe in is the following deal. China taking a hit right now, there are a lot of other people that are very excited. I don't undermine the level of brilliance and ingenuity that's being built in India with 1.4 billion people where they have the number one engineering school in the world that's even better than MIT called IIT, which I've spoken to in front of 5,000 of their engineers graduating class of, I don't know what it was, 2016 or 2017, 2018 when we were there. I trust that competition is going to go high with a prime minister uh, of, uh, of uh, the leader of India that's going to compete, the leader of other nations around the world that are going to compete. You're getting Armenia that's developing incredible engineers. They're calling it the Silicon Valley of Russia with the Armenian engineers that are coming up. Incredible engineers coming out of Colombia nowadays. I know it sounds weird saying Colombia, but a lot of other places. So I think competition officially became open. And I think a lot of countries are sitting there saying, great, we'll do it for you for cheap. We'll do it for you for cheap. We'll do it for you for cheap. I think it benefits the world economy. I think it hurts the China economy. Well, I like that perspective. That's a that's a really good perspective. And uh, um, assuming that all these that's why I say I think we need to bring in most of the rest of the countries in the world would have to agree with us to to go along with us. And that that would be the that would be the interesting aspect. And incidentally, as a former atheist, I, I just wonder oh, on your right hand side there, uh, there's, there seems to be some a god or something sitting next to you that you keep referring things to over here. There's somebody. There's there's an entity over there. Yeah, you get your right hand pen up. You turn to this entity periodically and ask for advice and what year this was. And I just, I, I, I would love to see that entity. What, what is that over there? Are you asking what these two statues are? No, I'm asking about the person that you actually ask voice questions like, what year were we in? What year were we in China? What we you know? What year was I? Was I speaking at, at the Indian University at ITT? Oh, oh, I'm sorry. It's Mario. Mario's sitting over here. He's Mario's the guy you were talking to from Guatemala when you guys were speaking in. Uh, you guys spoke in Spanish, no? Yes. yes. Mario is uh, here. Let me do this so you can see. Mario is who you spoke yes. to earlier. He's sitting over here. I, know, yes. Mario. Mario. I was just trying to give you a hard time, Patrick. About no, this. Okay. But you've got to consult this. You, you've got you've got these advisors next to you. All I have over here is a 10-week-old kitten. Well, the one thing you need to know about Mario is Mario went to uh, Harvard. He got his uh, bachelor's from Harvard. He got his uh, master's in uh, economy from Wharton Business School, went to Oxford for two years. But all of that is BS because he doesn't even have a two-year degree. That's Mario. I've known Mario since he was 18 years old working at dry cleaners in LA. And how old was I when the first time you met me? I was what, 26? 14 years ago. 14 years ago. I was 26, 27 years old. You're talking to a couple of people without college degrees. We're regular people here, John. Average and ordinary American citizens. That's what we are here. So let me tell you, Patrick, it's funny that I was chief economist at this major consulting firm. My only degree is a bachelor of science in business administration. Uh -huh. I, don't, I don't have an MBA. I'm not, you know, uh -huh. and I always used to say, I'm a terrible economist. I really am. But I knew enough to hire people that could create, I wouldn't know what, I wouldn't know how to create an econometric model, but I hired people who knew how to create econometric models. And you know, one time I gave the guy who was, the guy, my second in command at, in my department, I hired this PhD from uh, Harvard Business School. 
And this guy was second mind came in, comes up to me, he says, hey, aren't you afraid this guy's gonna take over your job? He's got a lot better credentials than you, you do. And I say, yeah, well, that's why I'm hiring because he's got the credentials, but he's not a good con artist like me. <laughs> wow. What is an economic hitman? A con artist. Exactly. Who then uses perception. We get back to this perception. Who uses, who uses the PhDs to create these fancy wow. reports and econometric models to convince people to do things that he wants to convince them to do. And I'm just glad that you weren't president of one of those countries that I was up against because I don't think you would, I don't think you would have bought into my deals necessarily. <laughs> And, I, and, and you're such a nice, sweet guy, I would not want to have had to call in the jackals on you. Right, well, listen, I will take that as an unofficial threat, is what I'll take out. <laughs> That's an unofficial threat if I were president, but thank God I'm just a business guy. John, I'm gonna do a quick uh, speed round. I'll give you a name, tell me one word that comes to mind. If you don't have any, just say no comment. Uh, Milton Friedman. Short-term profits. Edward Snor Snowden. <laughs> Um, hmm. Spy. Okay. Julian Assange. Idiot. Jeff Bezos. Oh. Um, oligarchy. Uh, George Bush. W. Which one was that? The first or the second? Uh, the son. The son. Hmm. Incompetent. Okay. Saddam Hussein. Uh, villain. <clears throat> Omar Torrijos. Charismatic. Uh, Jaime Roldes Aguilera. Integrity. Saudi Crown Prince. Control. Trump. Divisive. Mossadegh. <sighs> Democrat. Okay. Karl Marx. Marxist. Uh, Mohammed Reza Pahlavi. <laughs> that was supposed to bring a laugh. It did, of course. I'm like, <laughs> safest answer he could give was Marx. Jesus, it took, took you a while. I'm trying to hold my face while you're saying it for the audience to not see it. But uh, do you have another one for him, or are you sticking to Marxist? Uh, he's a good, he was a good Marxist. Okay, it was a good mark. I think it's a fair assessment. Mohammed Reza Pahlavi. Uh, dictator. Okay, Churchill. Hmm, Churchill. Hmm. Good one. Sh shrewd. Shrewd, out of all the words. And last but not least, your favorite, FDR. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I got to do two, two, two words there, New Deal. New Deal, fair enough. Well, John, I got to tell you, I've had a blast with you. I, I've really enjoyed this conversation. I know we went to a million different places and thank you for accommodating the conversation and being nimble and going through it and uh, taking some of the questions. I know we went, we went a million different directions, but this was a blast. By the way, if you're watching this, folks, I'm telling you, I highly, highly, I don't just say this to all the books, I highly recommend you get his books. I highly, we're going to put all the links below. We're going to put the links to the, the both economic hitman. And we're going to put the links below to the book that you just saw as well. Um, anybody that's in the world of business, anybody that's in the world of business, you have to know that you will sit down with people like him with a competitor in some sense, and you're going to have to figure out ways to survive in a competitive world. And he explains it so eloquently. Highly recommend going and listen to it. If you're not going to buy it, at least buy his audio book and listen to it. John, I'll give you the final words before we wrap up here. Any final words you got for the listeners? Patrick, I'm, I'm, I'm so grateful that you do what you do because I think that this is the essence of democracy. It's the essence of true, pure capitalism, which I am totally in favor of, of, of dialogue like this, of getting things out into the open. It's so important at this time in our, our, our history and in these difficult times we're going through that we get these things out there and that we have discussions like this. It's very important that we disagree, that we have the ability to disagree, that we listen to each other and we can disagree and learn from it. I've learned a lot from you today. I appreciate that. And to your listeners, I'd say, you know, I think we should all understand that we live in blessed times and this isn't to detract from the terrible suffering, the deaths, 
all the difficult things people are going through, but we really live at a time when we have the opportunity to communicate like this. We have the opportunity to see what's going on in the world. We're, we're living at a very, very auspicious time in human history. <clears throat> Excuse me, and I think we should be grateful uh, that we're alive at this time. And uh, I'm grateful and, and I deeply appreciate what you're doing, Patrick. And, and Mario is from Guatemala. I take groups of people to Guatemala in January. I'm planning on going down and hanging out with the Mayan shamans. I think the two of you ought to join me. We keep the group small, 15 people, intimate. Uh, we could, you know, you and I could entertain the, the, the other people for most of the time there having this discussion. But seriously, <laughs> I, think, I think you'd love to do that. It's a, it's a great, we spend a lot of time with Mayan shamans who are very, very brilliant people and, and open the doors to other ways of thinking. So please, uh, you and Mario, join us. Yeah. And all your listeners, well, another 13 of your listeners also. I can, I can definitely tell you, I will definitely entertain. I went back to Guatemala, to Tikal, Puerto Barrios, Livingston, Back in 06, December 26th through December 31st, I, I had a in Tikal Grande Agua. I had an incredible time in Guatemala yeah. when I went 14 years ago. So we you will, will see, you, you will see Tikal in a new way if you go with us. And we spend several days there, including ceremonies at night with the shamans. It's the information, by the way. This it's would a be fascinating a experience. And it's so you can just go to johnperkins.org and it's all the information is there. But we'll definitely let, do that. I got, but you know, you, you, you know, you and I are going to be debating the entire time. That's what I don't want. We'll be entertaining everybody the entire time. By the way, John, I too have learned a lot from speaking to you today. Uh, your perspective is very, very helpful. And I definitely appreciate that. Thank you so much for being a guest on Value Team, and Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. And this has been one of the most uh, challenging and fun interviews I've done. And to say it's challenging is a real compliment. And I, and, and I enjoy you. that. I enjoy I that. Thank, Thank you. you so much. This is your great work, Patrick. Thank you. What was your biggest takeaway from this interview? I mean, you saw when we talk about China, Mossadegh, Iran, the Shah, many different angles, some politics. They didn't want to go to it. We kind of went there, had to go three times to talk about China. He finally opened up, gave a little bit of insight. Was it a job that they did? Was it intentional? Was it accidental? How should they be held accountable? I want to hear from you. Comment below. I got two other interviews I want you to watch if you enjoyed this interview. One of them is with uh, General Spalding that was done seven months ago, pre-coronavirus, which he explains when he went and lived in China, what is China's game plan by Made in China 2025 with the China silent takeover, how China took over while the America's elite slept. If you've not watched this, watch it. The other one is an interview I did with Joshua Phillip from uh, Epoch Times, which is very, very deep on what he reveals about China. Click over here to watch this one if you've not watched it before. And if you've not subscribed to the channel, please do so. Thanks for watching, everybody. Take care. Bye-bye.